The Process Podcast, breaking down the daily habits, processes, and tools of high achievers. Now, here's your host, Brad Wilson. Hey there, boys and girls. It's the host of the Process Podcast, Brad Wilson. If you haven't yet, please take a moment and subscribe to The Process with Brad Wilson on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. It's one click of the button and is absolutely the most valuable thing you can do to support my show. Also, if you really love the show and you feel like it makes a difference in your life, I'm going to challenge you to tell somebody about it this week. All they have to do is search for Brad Wilson in iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, or iHeartRadio, and then click the first result that comes up. Today's guest on the show is Ruben Gonzalez. Ever since he was a kid, Ruben had aspirations of competing in the Olympics. The only problem is he wasn't ultra-athletic, or in his words, he was just good enough to warm the bench playing college soccer. As a matter of fact, his coach wouldn't even let him play until his team was up two goals. But one night, while watching TV in Houston, Texas, changed everything for him. He watched Scott Hamilton win gold in Sarajevo, and after seeing what Scott had overcome to be an Olympic champion, Ruben knew he had it in himself as well. So at 21 years old, 11 years later than people normally start, Ruben, an Argentinian living in Houston, Texas, began his career competing in the luge. To date, Ruben's the only Winter Olympian to compete in four different games in four different decades, and he's going for five at 59 years old. And despite being a self-described C student, he's also the best-selling author of The Courage to Succeed, The Inner Game of Success, and Fight for Your Dream. After reading The Courage to Succeed from cover to cover in three hours, I immediately wanted to set much, much bigger goals for myself which leads me to my giant goal of helping 1 million people in one year live a life that's true to themselves, followed up by running with the Bulls next year in Pamplona, Spain, as a celebration of reaching that goal. So if my bony body gets gored through the heart next year, you've got the inside scoop as to uh, how that happened. This is also why I asked you to tell a friend about my show in the upcoming week. I can't reach a million people without your help. All right, so without any further ado, here's my conversation with the always inspiring Ruben Gonzalez. Ruben, good morning, my friend. How are we doing? Great. How are you, Brad? I'm pumped. I, <laughs> I, about three days ago, I, I read your book from cover to cover. I uh, metaphorically closed it because I, I bought it on Kindle. I went, got a note card wrote some some giant goals, put my note card above my mirror in my bathroom. I see it every day. It, just a very inspiring and, and awesome story. Thank you so much for uh, sharing that with the world. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Brad. I, you know what? I pinch myself, especially from thinking about uh, where I came from. So, Ruben, can you, can you tell us what you do and the area in which you see yourself as an expert? I guess... I'm an expert in mental toughness and, and how to get yourself to take action. Uh, I see that fear of failure and fear of the unknown hold most people back. And along the way, I've been able to figure out some little techniques that work for me that help me put on the blinders and, and, and take that bold action. And it's amazing how when you do that, uh, you start realizing that those fears were unfounded. What techniques do you use specifically? Well, I use different ones. You just mentioned one, uh, the, uh, having uh, pictures of your goals around you all the time so that you're constantly reminded because if you don't, life happens and six months go by and then you realize, oh my gosh, I, I was supposed to be going after this goal, right? So that's one thing. And then your affirmations. And, uh, and we'll go deeper into some of these things, but who you associate with, uh, people that keep you accountable, and uh, your daily routines, starting the day, doing something, and then at the end of the day, uh, writing down what your goal for next day is so you can hit the, the ground running. All these little things that just kind of get you uh, focused. And uh, another one is just focusing on what you want, not focusing on the fear, right? Trying to, like I said before, put on the blinders. And one thing that I've been doing these last few days is 
whenever I, I move to do something and a lot of times there's friction that gets in the way as far as life goes, I've been saying to myself, like, I'm too tired to work out, right? I, I tell myself, am I going to let that emotion stop me from doing what I need to do? If I don't feel like writing, am I going to let that feeling stop me from doing what's going to allow me to do what I need to do? So I think that whenever you encounter that friction, asking yourself that question, am I going to let this stop me? Am I got <laughs> Right. Yeah. No. That's great. <clears throat> That's great. And and what you I'm sure what you find is that 5 minutes ago you didn't feel like working out, but as soon as you got that those muscles moving, uh, you kind of got into it and the feeling changed. And uh, the action really uh, affects the the feeling. It absolutely does. Uh, so spe- so I'm assuming that the the most important skill or attribute that you have to yourself is mental toughness. Can you tell me where that mental toughness came from? I was an immigrant kid. I my family moved from Argentina when I was six years old, and so all of a sudden I'm in Queens, New York. I'm the only kid in my class didn't speak English, and school was tough. And kids tend to pick on on whoever is a little bit different. And I was I got picked on a lot. And uh, I always thought there was a little bit something wrong with me because I was getting picked on. I thought there's got to be something wrong. And I learned how to read books by reading. Uh, I learned how to speak English by reading books, uh, adventure books. And then that led to my dad getting me into biographies. And then. I, um, he said, you know, you'll, you'll learn, right? Uh, success leaves clues. If you'll study the lives of great people, you'll figure out what works and what doesn't work. And over and over and over, I saw that perseverance was the key, that if you just kept fighting or refused to quit, then at least you had a shot, right? You had, it, there's no guarantees, but you had a shot. So I made a decision as a 12-year-old after reading enough of these biographies that, that from today on, Ruben doesn't quit anything. And it was a quality decision that I stuck to. And so much so that by high school, kids were calling me uh, Bulldog. That became my high school nickname because I was tenacious. And so uh, that's probably my most important skill uh, uh, or, or attribute. I don't think it's a skill. It's, a, it's an attribute, just perseverance. I'm a hardhead. And if you read enough biographies or if you don't like to read, you tune into the biography channel, uh, you'll learn that, you know, all those people were pretty tenacious too. Because because uh, success is not easy. It's gonna it, that friction that you talked about. It it's there all the time. It's an uphill climb, but it sure is worth it. When you think about those biographies, what's the first one that comes to your mind? Who's the first person that you think of that had a dramatic impact on how you how you look at life? The it was the Pattons, the the Helen Kellers, the the Wilma Rudolphs. You know. Uh, the ones that hit me the hardest were the ones that had the people that had to overcome big challenges to reach their their goals and dreams because they they took my excuses away uh, and it's funny when i when I was a kid I'd pick up a biography and you they always have a person's picture on the cover and I look at that cover and I think to myself, man, I can never be like him, I can never be like her. I put them up on a pedestal, and they're no good to me up there. But then when I cracked the book open and started reading, I realized that when they were young, they were just an ordinary person like me. And so then I realized, wow, if I do some of these things, I, I, maybe I can grow into the type of person that can uh, do some great things. And uh, it's funny, I, I believe that the dream, you know, is huge, right? But it's, it's really like a little carrot on the stick that gets you to do the things you need to do to, uh, you know, to grow, right? And to become the best you that you can be. And it's really, at the end of the, at the, end of the day, it's not about the dream, it's about the person you became. I agree. I, I, I find that so true in my own life. And I've always said that if I get everything I want, then I get everything I want. But the battle, the, the daily struggles, overcoming all those little things, that's what makes you who you are. That's what gives you strength. And really that's how you learn and grow. And it's, it's the only way that's a commonality that I found in this podcast that everybody that I've talked to, they've said, do the work. You know, there's no shortcuts. You have to do it. There's no like, there's no life hacks that get you that allow you to accomplish your giant goals. Sure, you can find efficiencies, but you got to do the work. You can't be afraid of the work. Right, and and a lot of people, too many people, 
they want to be successful without the work. Well, that's called a lottery ticket, you know. And, and the people that win the lottery, a couple of years later, they're they're back where they were before because they don't know how to hang on to the money or what to do with it. And so you, it, you have to do the work, yeah, you know, because that's how that's how you learn. That's how you get strong. Uh, I had this teacher in grade school that whenever we complained about a test or too much homework or whenever we got whiny about anything, she says, you know, it builds that, it, it, it builds character, it builds character. And I hate it when he, she said that, right? And, uh, but now I agree, you know, that's what builds character, it makes you strong inside and it makes you stronger for the next battle. So it's like training. It's like lifting weights. You achieved uh, your big dream of competing in the Olympics, despite overcoming numerous obstacles. What are some mistakes that you saw people make that you feel contributed to their failure to achieve their dreams? You know, when I, when I first went to Lake Placid, they put me in this class, a beginner's class, there's about 15 of us. And we were going down the, um, it, it was the springtime, so there was no ice. We're going on wheels down the concrete track from the half mile point and going about 50, 55 miles an hour, all we're wearing is tennis shoes, shorts, and a t-shirt, and a helmet, right? It was brutal. If you crash, I mean, you have really good traction, right? It's, it's a lot easier than ice luge, uh, but, but it was scary, and, and, and you knew that if you crash, it's straight to the hospital. And when we got to the bottom, they put the U.S. team, they put them on a truck, drive them back to the top, and us newbies, they'd hand us the sled, and we had to walk back up. They're making it tough on purpose, Right, because uh, just like the first couple of weeks of uh, a football practice, uh, coach wants to see who really wants to be in my team. Right, who wants it? Who's got that desire? And apparently, a lot of these people didn't have enough desire because every day there's one or two showing, you know, less showing up, and they had all these great excuses. You know, oh, it's too expensive, it's too far away, I miss my family, I don't like the luge. Well, I didn't like it either. I was killing myself out there, right? But I, I had the desire. And it wasn't about whether I liked the luge or not. I saw the luge as a vehicle that was going to get me to the dream, the Olympics, right? And I, I and it, and I saw it as probably it was probably the only vehicle that was going to get me to that dream. So I had no choice. I had to go on. And so I think that what kept a lot of those people from sticking it out was their some of them might have been lack of belief that they didn't think they could make it, and others lack of desire. And uh, I always had the desire, ever since I was 10 years old, I wanted to be in the Olympics. Uh, but it wasn't until I was 21 when I saw Scott Hamilton, the figure skater, win the gold medal at the 84 Sarajevo Games. He gave me hope, right? And I said to myself, if that little guy can do it, I can too. I'll be in the next Olympics no matter what. It's a done deal, right? In my mind, I, I, I knew I was going to do it. So for the first time, when I saw Scott Hamilton at the age of 21, I had the belief and the desire. And now I was ready to take action. And when the going got tough, I was, I was ready to keep on keeping on. Because the belief will get you started. The desire will keep you going, right? It'll keep you going when the going gets tough. It's kind of funny. It's sort of like a biography come to life when you saw Scott Hamilton win the gold. You look up to these people who overcome massive challenges to accomplish amazing things. And Scott Hamilton was real life, present, boom. I'm going to do this thing. It was crazy. It was overnight. I mean, it was, it, it was like somebody turned on the lights and I realized, hey, if he can do it, I can do it. And it's funny now, uh, you know, as a, I've been speaking professionally, gosh, since 2002, so 16 years now. When I'm up on stage, I, my goal is to become Scott, ha to do what Scott Hamilton did for me, to do that for the audience, right? I want him walking out of my talk thinking, man, if that guy can... That bench warmer, if that guy can make it to the Olympics even one time, we can do anything, right? And so hopefully they're walking out thinking, you know, with more belief and they're more, more, they're ready to uh, face those, those challenges and take more risks. And, and then you start getting different results when you do that. Well, I haven't seen you speak in real life, but I can attest that after reading your book, that is exactly how I felt. It's, it's so cool, you know, uh, you, you get these emails, and it's funny. There's like it seems like there's a two year gestation period for most people. Brad, it'll probably t it, yours was like a two minute uh, gestation period. But I'll get these emails that always say, uh, "Golly, I heard you sp speak two years ago and fill in the blank." Right? I lost fifty pounds, or I paid off my mortgage, or I I started my own business, or it's like their whatever their big dream was, and uh, and it's oh that that feels so good. I mean, it makes you realize, wow. Maybe I'm making a little bit of a difference here and there. I read a lot, and 
I ask myself, you know, how can how can I provide value in people's lives? And I know that the number one regret of the dying is that they don't live a life that was true to themselves. And so many times in my life, I've asked myself that question. Am I living a life that's true to me? And reading your book the whole time, you can see that no matter the obstacles of basically being broke, not having tons uh, out of this world athletic ability, it didn't matter. You were going to live a life that was true to you. <laughs> and for you, that was you know traveling down the ice at 90 miles an hour to, to, to make it to the Olympics. But um, so I've publicly stated my goal of inspiring a million people to, to live a life that's true to themselves. And, and that's because of you. And I want to ask, ask you, so what actionable advice do you have for somebody out there who maybe wakes up in the morning and feels uninspired with the life that they currently live? Yeah, you know, uh, sometimes people will come up to me after a talk and they'll ask, uh, they'll say, well, what do you do if you don't have a dream? Right. Because some people, are they just they forgot what their dream was. And I tell them, look, what, what was your dream when you were a kid? You know, when you were 10, 12 years old, what, what was it? And, well, I wanted to play NBA basketball, but I'm too old now or whatever. Right. They, 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 they follow it with all these these excuses why it won't work. But I tell them, well, it's OK, you know, but see basketball. Just just think about basketball that that your your childhood dream it's it can direct you to an industry. Maybe you can become the you know at church you can you can be the coach for the basketball team for the kids, right? Maybe you can work at your local uh, uh, basketball team, you know, in front office or whatever. You'll be surrounded by basketball, uh, but you'll be happier because you'll be you'll be doing what what your passion is, and so uh, that I, that kind of steers them in the right direction. Uh, you know, when you, you said something earlier that that reminded me when I, when I was in high school, I remember reading this, this, uh, this study they'd done on octogenarians, 80-year-old people, and they asked them, what are your biggest regrets in life? And one and two were uh, not spending enough time with my family, and then the other one was uh, uh, playing life too safe, not taking enough risks. When I read that, I made a decision, hey, whenever I have a, an option, I'll just take the riskier option, so when I'm 80 years old, I'm, I won't have that, <laughs> that, um, <laughs> that regret, right? And then the next phase, I, I kept thinking about it, and I thought, you know what? I want to have so many adventures when I'm, you know, in my life that when I'm a grandpa, I'm going to have so many great stories that all the grandkids will be around me because I'm going to be the one with the stories. <laughs> so I wasn't even dating back then, but I was always thinking, already thinking about what I was going to do when I was a grandpa. So yeah, uh, it, it's just a decision, you know, and you only live once. You might as well go for it. And I think it's such a wise thing to to think about the stories that you want to tell your grandchildren because uh, in Tuesdays with Maury, he talks about uh, we all believe that we all know we're going to die, but we don't believe it. We know we're going to get old, but we don't believe it. The reality is it's happening. Life is happening and our time is going to pass. And one day, hopefully, God willing, we get to be older and wiser and we get to reflect back on our life and I want to reflect back on my life and be happy and, and proud of the things that I did and not have those regrets. And I think that's one of the biggest tragedies in life are, are people who are 70 and 80 years old because life is not a fairy tale. There's not some uh, you know prince or princess charming who comes and saves your life and grabs you from you know whatever – it is that whatever situation that you feel stuck in and saves you, you're responsible for yourself. Yeah, you have to bootstrap it. Get out there and it's on it. you. And not everybody, not everybody does it. And you don't want to be one of those people that doesn't do it. So, yeah, I, I hope that through this project, I can th those people out there that feel stuck that you know, maybe don't believe that their time is passing are going to wake up and realize I got to get shit done. I got to do this stuff today. I'm, I'm going to be, uh, you know, the person that I want to be. And that person that you want to be, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be what I believe or what root, what you believe. It's what is inside you. Yeah. It has to be your dream not, not your dad's dream or, or your mom's dream. Right. <laughs> My parents wanted me to be a doctor, right? Uh, and, oh, they pushed. I was the oldest one, so you're going to have to be the doctor. And, uh, 
I, I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, uh, work-wise. So I, I did pre-med. I was a chemistry biology major in college just because I figured, hey, I don't know what I want to do. I might as well do pre-med, get my folks off my back for four years. And obviously, I had no desire for it, so I didn't have the grades. And there's no way. I mean, I'm, I'm saving lives by not being a doctor. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if I had followed them, then I would be, you know, I, I, I'd be sick inside, right? I, there'd be a hole in my, in my heart. And uh, it's funny. I, I, I graduated, and then I started waiting tables, and they wanted to kill me. But I said, no, I love this because this is almost like having a little business, right? Because you, if you take care of your section, you know, they take care of you. And I, always wanted, I knew I always wanted to have my own business. And I got in sales. Uh, I was a copier salesman for a while. And then this kid, right before the Salt Lake City Olympics, he asked me, uh, uh, hey, Ruben, when you get back from the Olympics, will you be my show and tell project in school? And I pictured show and tell when I was a kid, you know, hey, 20 kids in a classroom. Everybody shows something off, talks about it for five minutes. I thought, great. Yeah, I'll be in and out of there in five minutes. I took the sled. I took my my uh, Olympic torch, uh, the helmet. I thought, man, no no prisoners, right? I'm going to win this. I'm finally going to get a gold medal at something. <laughs> I go to the school. <laughs> the principal takes me to the auditorium. There's 200 kids sitting there on the floor. And he says, you got 45 minutes. Have at them. And they turn it into an assembly, except they forgot to tell me. I thought I was going to die. And I just I actually said a little prayer, right? It's called the desperation prayer. <laughs> God, what do I do now? <laughs> That's a really good one, by the way. <laughs> and what I felt I needed to do was just tell them your story and give them some pointers to help them re- reach their goals and dreams. And I did. And afterwards, the uh, principal gets in my face. He starts shouting at me. And he goes, man, you got a gift. You're better than people we pay. You do this for a living. And I said, what? You get paid for show and tell? And he says, no, it's a speaking profession. Don't you know anything? <laughs> and I guess I didn't. Uh, but he was so in my face about it that for the next three days, I thought about it. I thought, hey, I'm just being myself up there, telling my story. I'm having a blast. And maybe I can inspire some people to really go for it in life. And so I quit my job three days later. I figured if I can sell a copying machine, I can sell a Reuben too. And I just started hitting the phones and uh, and built a business. And so, I mean... <laughs> I'm a shy guy, believe it or not, and uh, and I'm a professional speaker. I made C's in English, and I'm a best-selling author. I was always the last kid picked to play sports in school because I was slow. A lot of heart, but no body. And I'm a four-time Olympian going on five. I mean, golly, uh, it, it's crazy. So if I can do those things, imagine what anybody else can do. It's just a matter of just going for it. What do you mean going on five? Oh, <laughs> I competed in Calgary in 88. And then I competed in Albertville in 1992. So I was eight years straight luge. And then I quit. I was done. And five years, for five years, I didn't do anything. And then my coach called me out of the blue. And he talked me into coming back, starting to train for, for Salt Lake City. And I said, I'll only go if my brother goes. And, uh, and my brother went too. He started training. He took up the sport of luge and he learned it. And, and we, be, we made Olympic history. First time two brothers competed against each other in the men's luge in the Olympics. And that was, that was uh, uh, Salt Lake City, 2002. And then I quit again. And for the next six years, I was building my speaking business. So that was a big challenge. And then uh, I started getting bored. And so I thought, you know, no one's ever done four Winter Olympics in four different decades. Uh, that'd be great. Maybe I should go for it. Got back into it after a six or se- six or seven year break, and uh, and I qualified and I made Vancouver. And I was forty seven. Everybody thought I was a coach, <laughs> and then I quit again. And uh, for seven years, it's my I got this seven year itch, a, a weird one, right? <laughs> and I'm kind of like a Brett Favre of luge. But um, <laughs> this past October, I I went back. I lost about twenty five pounds uh, that had crept up on me, and and lost it. And then uh, this magazine wanted me to uh, get into my loose suit for, for a picture for the magazine. And I thought, man, looking good, right? I was actually looking really good. And so I thought, maybe I got another one in me. I went, I went to late to uh, uh, Calgary uh, this past October just to test it, right? See if this old body can still handle the G-forces. You're pulling six Gs on some of those curves, and I'm 55. I'm sliding better than ever. I'm actually listening to the coaches for a change. And they, they said, yeah, you know, you got a shot. You know, we got to work on some things, but uh, you got a shot. And so I came back in December. Uh, there was going to be a World Cup race in Calgary. And I went. And, so, and I was older than some of the coaches now. <laughs> and in order, and I've got a 25-year-old sled. And new sleds are a lot faster, right, because technology. 
And uh, I was going to have to qualify for this World Cup race. I was going to have to break my own personal speed record at the Calgary track just to qualify for this race. And you get five shots to do it, and I did it on one of the runs by four one hundredths of a second. Somebody said, man, doing it on that, that sled belongs in a, in a museum, not on the track, man. It's like you going to Wimbledon and trying to play with a wooden racket. I mean, that's, you got to get yourself another sled, that's for sure. And so anyway, so I'm going for Beijing. Uh, in Beijing, we have a plan set up. And uh, in the next two years, these next two seasons, they don't count towards, towards qualification. So we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. Because when I went to Lake Placid the first time, uh, they said, you know, if you want to go to the Olympics in just four years, it, it's going to be brutal because we're going to have to take, by now you should have to, you should have 10 years experience. And so we're going to have to cram 10 years worth of luge learning into two years because the last two years you have to compete against the best in the world to, to qualify. And so I, I broke a lot of bones. I got hurt more than most people because I was doing it. And by rushing it, uh, my fundamentals are not very good. I, I can slide well. But my start technique was always awful. And so now we're going all the way back to basics, right? Like John Wooden or like um, uh, Vince Lombardi. You know, they always taught about, hey, master the basics, right? And so the next two years, we're just going to focus on that, mainly on my start. And then the last two years, uh, there's 15 World Cup races all over the world. And then top 37 get to go. And, uh, you know, they tally up the results for the last two years. Top 37 in the world get to go. And 38 watches it on TV. And so uh, when I make it, I'll be 59 years old in Beijing. I'll be the oldest Winter Olympian in history. Uh, the, the oldest one right now is a 59-year-old curler from Sweden from the 1924 Olympics. It's crazy. Uh, so I'm going to do it in the luge. And I'll be the first person to do five Olympics in five different decades. I mean, how cool is that? Uh, this guy wrote a screenplay about it. And I think, you know, once I do that, I think it'll sell. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Beijing is in how many years? How many years away? In, it's in four years. It's in 2022. 2022, Beijing. 59 years old. Yeah. When does it end? When, do, yeah. when does it end? Are we gonna we're gonna go for? T- I don't know. 20, it's funny. Twenty thirty. Are you gonna be a eighty year old man sliding down? <laughs> yeah, geriatric luge. I, <laughs> I, you know what? I um, and I tell people. I and I, I, there's a page on my website. I just I just went ahead and got a URL that points to it. It's called oldestolympian.com. Oldestolympian.com. And it tells that story that I just told you. It's got cool pictures and videos and stuff. My goal is I, I don't want my record to last another 70 years. I want it to last four years max, right? I want to uh, other older athletes to see me and say, hey, you know, we got to get back into training. If that guy can do it, surely I can too. You know, how cool would it be if you started getting a bunch of 40 and 50-year-old guys that actually qualify to make it to the Olympics and maybe guys that competed, you know, 20 years ago? That I, it, it would be incredible. I have no idea if there are too many people out there that are like you though. I think I, I think you're a pretty u- u- unique guy. If I were you, I wouldn't be disappointed if uh there's not a lot of 60-year-olds flying down the luge uh, over the next decade. <laughs> okay. I, th- I think right. your record might stand for a while. Okay. Well, maybe in the luge it will. It's funny, you know, I I I was born in Argentina and I competed for Argentina. Um, in the first four years that I was under the U.S., the U.S. team uh, trained me and they taught me. And I traveled with them, but they said, you're going for Argentina because we need more countries. The only, that's the only way we'll train you because uh, we need more countries in the sport because we're on the verge of getting kicked out of the Olympics because there's not enough countries doing the luge. This is back in 1984. And then for all the other Olympics, I trained under this big international team. But now I'm, I'm going to be these last... Last uh, couple of years, uh, I'm going to be training under the U.S. team again, right? Because it, it's just better coaching. And uh, when I contacted them about about that, uh, I, t- I was talking to one of the coaches. His name's Fred. And he says, yeah, you know, uh, I said, I just want my last one. You know, I started with the U.S. I want to finish with the U.S. And he goes, oh, who are you trying to kid, Ruben? This is not going to be your last one. <laughs> so I guess I got a reputation now. How does your wife feel about being a 59-year-old Ooh. loser? Right. Not 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 too not too <laughs> yeah. happy. Don't want to talk uh, about that. No, no, that's not a good place to go. But it's it's um, you know, I think I'm being an example, and this is going to be good for business for sure. If we if we get this movie deal, which you know, movies getting a movie is a, it, it. 
I, I really believe is like the lottery because first you have to have a great screen, you know, the, a good screenplay, and then you got to get a major group to buy it. Then they actually have to make it, and then it actually has to be good, right? Because <laughs> it could be a dud. Uh, but um, uh, if it if it all came together, and who knows? You know, things have come together for me in the past. Shoot, we we'd be set. Oddly, I have a screen screenplay writer coming on the show in less than a month, and I know I'm personal friends with the producer of Black Swan. Really? Yeah, we we play poker together in Los Angeles. Uh, <laughs> well, if you can connect me to, especially the screenwriter, I would love for for him to uh, take a look at at the screenplay we have and see if it has if it at least has good bones. Absolutely, right? uh, absolutely. Uh, I'll do that because you know the editing is, is is huge. And Pete too, the the movie producer. I think he can. Um, he probably has contacts. I'm sure he'll love your story. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll do whatever I can to help you out. Wow. Oh, well, okay. Well, that brings up something. When I read your article about how you got all excited about reading my book, and then you decided to put out your goals and how you're going to impact a million people, uh, I meant to tell you this when you were on when we were talking on the phone before. When you Start telling everybody about your goal. There's going to be a group of people, most of them, average people, are probably going to laugh at you, right? Uh, and that's normal because they don't believe. And, and, and you intimidate them just by going for it. And they think that you winning is going to make them look bad. That's just how most people are. But by putting it out there and by becoming known as the guy is going to impact a million people and the guy's going to run with the bulls in Pamplona, when you when you come across somebody that could possibly help you or know somebody, then they'll be able to connect you just like you did with me. And so you have to become known for your goal and, and it'll make it easier. I've, yeah. I've already gone through that in life. Uh, I, was, I was also a server at 19 years old. I worked at Applebee's and I had the dream of being a professional poker player. And this was before poker was mainstream. And I showed up to work an hour early every day. I read books uh, I stayed stayed late reading books, and I told every person that I was going to be a professional poker player, and people did laugh. People laughed in my face. They told me it wasn't possible. Um, so I'm very familiar with getting laughed at, and I'm perfectly comfortable with it. And you know what? I, I uh, at the so, no at the Calgary Olympics, the first one, 1988. That was my first Olympics. Is also the Jamaican bobsledders' uh, first Olympics, and. Especially back then, I mean, uh, it was totally dominated by the by the Swiss, the Germans, and the uh, Northern Italians, which are basically Germans too. And uh, you practically had to be blonde haired, right, to to do this sport and speak German. So the the, the Jamaicans kind of stood out, right? <laughs> and uh, they they were getting bullied at the Olympics. I mean, just like in Cool Runnings, when they're making fun of them, you know, uh, hey, leave. leave you know, leave the bobsled to the men. Go play with your inflatable toy in the beach. I mean, I saw that two or three times. And I was shocked. It was totally unolympic behavior. And finally, I went up to one of them and I said, man, what does that make you feel like? I mean, I can't believe they're laughing at your face. And I'll never forget what the guy said. He said, hey, we're winners. We intend to get the last laugh. And I thought, whoa, these guys are tough. And so I kept my eye on them. Four years later, I saw them at the Albertville Olympics, right? Now they got four years' experience. They're pretty good. Nobody was laughing at their face. A few people laughed behind their back, but that, that was it. And then the next time I saw them was uh, Salt Lake City. They've been at it for almost 15 years. They were solid. And, and get this. These guys were sprinters, okay? They were better athletes than the Germans were, but they just didn't have the bobsled technique. They didn't know how to get into the sled, how to drive. They just needed to learn. But now they had the speed and pretty decent technique. Uh, Salt Lake City, they actually beat one of the U.S. sleds. They got a Disney movie. They're laughing all the way to the bank. <laughs> and so what I learned from those guys is that, uh, you know, when when you tell people about your dreams, you're going to go through three stages. You know, first people are going to laugh at you. Then they're going to watch you. And when you start making things happen, look out. They're going to start admiring you. But if you can't handle that laughter stage, you'll never make it to the admiration stage. And uh, And you've been through all three. To my knowledge... There's not many bobsledding movies about the Swiss or or the or the Germans. <laughs> I think the only time they've been in a movie is their cameo in Cool Runnings. So uh, <laughs> you're right. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, you know, I'm sure it'd be great to be a medalist. You know, I mean, gosh, those guys are amazing. But uh, I think I can help a lot more people being the you know 
I, I tell people I'm like your neighbor, man. I mean, the, your neighbor's probably a better athlete than me, but but I but I stuck with it I, long enough to learn some skills, right? And then I use those skills to reach the dream. You know, it's always going to be hard at the beginning, so give yourself time. Most people compare themselves to the world champ, or they com- they compare themselves to the best in the world, but every day. You should compare yourself to you and be the best be the right. best Ruben that you've ever been tomorrow. And all you can do is be the best that you can be. I, yeah, I mean, and I can't control the results. It's funny, at a Q&A after a, a, a talk, you know, if, there's, if it's a smaller talk, like less than, I don't know, 500 people, we, I offer, hey, if you guys want to do a Q&A, it's a lot of fun. And a lot of times they'll ask, did you win a medal, right? And, when I, and I say, or are you going to win the medal at, you know, at the next Olympics? Yeah, I tell them, man, at my age, I'd be happy to make the cover of AARP. But uh, when, I, when I tell them I didn't win a medal, you can see the, a lot of the people in the audience that kind of deflate, right? It's like they're let down. Is it, and, and I tell them, look, guys, I'm just happy to get to play with the big boys, okay? Uh, I can't control the result. I can only control how hard I can train and how good my sled is and, you know, and, and, and what I eat and, and, how, and who I hang around with. And, uh, and if I did all those things to the best of my capacity, even if I came in last place, I can look at myself in the eyes in the mirror and be, and be proud because I got to go. Absolutely. And you did the best that you, you, you were the best you. No regrets. And, and that's what you can control. So I'm going to flip, I'm going to flip the, the switch a little. We're going to change directions. In my previous talk with Bob Babinski, we talked about a guy named Dan Gottlieb. And he was a young man who was driving down the New Jersey Turnpike. A uh, tire fell off another car, crashed through his windshield. He broke his neck, and it paralyzed him from the chest down. He described the event as a, a big black thing falling from the sky. And all of us at some all of us at some time or another are going to be hit by a big black thing falling from the sky. Could you tell me about an instance like that in your own life and what you learned from it and how you grew? About a year and a half before the Calgary Olympics, the first one, I was training for a World Cup race in St. Moritz, Switzerland. And, and I wasn't having any big problems at that track. I was just trying to fine tune. And so we were training in the morning, and the Italians were training in the afternoon. And, and that year, the Italians were, were, were the best. And so I went to Curve 13, which was a place where I wanted to tweak some stuff. And for a couple hours, you know, through that training session, I was just watching them zoom by. And when you watch Luge on TV, it's boring, okay? I mean, I change channels. But, uh, uh, but live, if you're, th- you know, if you're just a couple of yards away from the track and somebody's zipping by at 90 miles an hour and you actually feel the wind they make and, uh, and you can see the whites of their eyes for an instant, man, it's, it's nuts, okay? And so you start thinking, man, are they sacrificing them off the top? I mean, you start getting these weird thoughts. And so here comes one of the guys, zoo, and I mumble to myself, man, I can't believe I do that. Next one, zoo, I can't believe I do that. Zoo, I can't believe I, I just did that for two hours, right? The next day, as soon as I got to curve 13 on my, on my run, my mind reminded me, that's right, Ruben, you can't do that. And I totally froze. I didn't steer. I went straight up into the woods, which is this retaining wall, this lip up on top of the track, keeps you from flying out. And, uh, and, and it came back down. La- next thing I remember, or last thing I remember, is I was flying through the air, kind of doing a somersault, which is really bad luge position, by the way. And uh, through my legs, I can see behind me the sled just broke into pieces and it's coming at me. I'm coming, going down the straightaway about 80 miles an hour. I thought if that thing hits me, I'm dead. So I just did a Greg Luganus, man. I just dove off the side of the track and I hit up. I don't know what I hit, uh, but I broke my hand. I uh, broke my foot and I totaled my sled. And this is a year and a half before the Olympics. And I had a, I had a pity party for three days, which is probably my record. I'm usually a pretty positive person. And it wasn't until halfway back over the Atlantic uh, flying home, I got my head straight. I thought, you know what? Broken bones, that's temporary inconvenience. 40 days from now, it'll be stronger than before. So that's not a big deal. Tomorrow, I'm going to the gym, or right? I got to get back on the horse. And so I promised myself I'd do that. And then I thought, man, I can't afford to buy another sled, but maybe I can borrow a sled. And so I made it, started making a list of people that could possibly lend me one of their old sleds. And, uh, and, and Adam Cook from the New Zealand team, he, he lent me his sled. 
He's shorter than me, quite a bit shorter. And so his sled was kind of small. It didn't fit right, but it sure beat, you know, sliding on my butt. <laughs> and so I, I qualified for that next Olympics in, on, in Adams. Uh, and I told you Calgary, but it was Salt Lake City. It was right, that happened right before Salt Lake. But I, I, I qualified on Adams' sled, and I raced on his sled. It was either Eleanor Roosevelt, I think she said, um, you know, do what you can right now with what you have right now. Don't wait till everything's perfect, right? And so I slid on Adam's sled, and, and and it worked. So, uh, but that was, you know, that that could have really, that that could have really, uh, uh, if I, if I had not gotten my attitude straight, and attitude is a very fragile thing. You have to protect your attitude. If I hadn't t- turned it around up on that on that plane ride, that might have been the end. Yeah, it's very scary, and I would imagine something that that can break quite a bit of people. Like a large percentage of people would break after a crash like that. Yeah, I've got some friends that are Paralympians, and uh, in fact, uh, I'm thinking of one right now, John Register. You need to you need to have him on your podcast. Uh, he incredible story. I mean, he was like eighth in the U.S. in in hurdles. He hit a hurdle, broke his leg so badly they had to amputate from the knee wow. down or from below the knee. And uh, as part of his his, but the guy's a winner. I mean, these Paralympians. I live here in Colorado Springs, and 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 there's always events going on for you know wheel wheelchair uh, uh, basketball and stuff like that. They just we were just at the at, at the Warrior Games uh, about a month ago with, with my kids here at the Olympic uh, at, at the uh, Air Force Academy. Those guys are amazing because something really bad happened to them, right? It's like that tire hitting the uh, Dan, and but these guys they just decided, hey, it's not going to knock me down. It'll knock me down, but it's not going to knock me out. And, and they get back in the game. I have so much respect for those guys. You know, there's a lot of research that where they document happiness levels. And to one thing that you talked about earlier, winning the lottery, um, people's happiness level jumps up dramatically. But over time, sort of goes back to their average. And it's the same with a catastrophic injury like that. People in the beginning, they get depressed. But at the end, they eventually get to... Uh, the happiness level that they were their baseline right wow. and um, that's I, I didn't know that but it makes sense yeah yeah and one thing that that it stuck with me from that Dan Gottlieb interview is he said that when he broke his neck uh, it allowed his soul to breathe he only had a limited amount of time to work on all the things that really mattered to him. So he eliminated all the other BS that was pre- preventing him from working on his passion and pursued only his passion after that. It's a winner. Yes, sir. What's something that on the mental strength side of things, what are, what's something that people focus a lot of time and attention on that doesn't give them much in the way of results? Whatever you focus on gets bigger in your, in your life, right? And, so you buy, uh, let's say you buy a red, uh, a red truck. All of a sudden you start noticing, it's like, wow, everybody bought a red truck uh, today because you start noticing them because you're excited about it, right? A lot of people focus on what's the worst that could happen, right? Or what if it doesn't work out? They're, or they're focusing on the challenge. And, and successful people, they focus on the dream. They focus on what I, what do I want to do? Because see, the dream gives you strength. It gives you energy. It gives you um, a passion. It gives you everything you need to bust through those obstacles. But if you focus on the obstacle, then you just go your 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 willpower just drops. And so uh, I think you you should got to focus on the dream. I love that, and you're absolutely right. The cognitive bias when we when we set the goals, we get, the big goals, we give ourselves a target to shoot at, and all of a sudden, as we're going through life, we our subconscious mind's going, and we start seeing opportunities that we wouldn't have seen if we wouldn't have had that goal. And when you focus on the negative things, you start seeing, you start, you know, the, the failures start becoming obvious to you, and they reinforce that negative belief. And then all of a sudden, it's really hard to do the thing that you really want to do. Yeah, it's like a death spiral, right? And, and so that goes back to who you can hang around with. Right. I mean, I've read we probably read all the same books. I mean, we're both really into personal development. And I think that 90 percent of success is who you hang around with. You hang around with, you know, like minded people that are going places. Uh, They're going to keep you accountable. They're going to help you. They'll give you tips. And uh, you hang around a bunch of whiners, then you'll become like the 
people you, you hang around with. So that's, I think that's huge. As soon as we moved here, we, I tried to get my kids, you know, I took them down to the Olympic training center and it's 45 minutes away, but my kids, they both, they, 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 they both got into judo and I'll drive them over there. And it's just a, you know, it's, it's just a kid's class, but, but it's coached by the national coach. So it's a great place. And, and it's a very high standard. And I take them over there and I tell them, look, if you ever tell me that you're done with judo is not your thing, then let me know. Okay. Let's not waste time on something you don't want to do. But uh, I'm bringing you here because you're learning life or you're learning principles that help you in life. And it's not just about the judo, but they've been in it for eight years. They've both been state champs a couple of times and they're, they're, they're good, right? They're working their way up the belts. Uh, but it's about getting them in that atmosphere of champions because I know that's, you know, it's about who you hang around with. Yeah. We're the average of the five people that we spend the most time with. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so true. I mean, it, it's it's huge and a lot of times uh if you're assigning numbers to those people some people are negative numbers and your 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 average goes up just by no longer associating with them yeah and you don't want to i read somewhere you don't want to be the smartest person in your group you know you need to go to another group right because because you're not learning you're not learning if you're the smartest person in your group then your problem is you got a big ego. <laughs> you're just trying to be the big shot. <laughs> and your your average goes down, right? If you're the highest no, highest sure. number in your group, then the the other four people they bring your average down. So you want to be the person. You want to yeah. be the dumbest guy among your friends. Yeah. Then you're going to get smarter. Absolutely. So, what's the best advice given to you by a mentor, and how did that affect your life? Well, something that comes to mind now when when I got started speaking. Uh, it was right after the Olympics, right after uh, Salt Lake. So it was uh, March, March of 2002. Well, March, April, May, I was speaking in schools all over Houston. But I was so focused on calling schools that I forgot that the summer was going to be dead. And so the summer we made nothing, right? We're already $50,000 in credit card debt for, for all the luge stuff. And now uh, no money. And for three months, uh, zero. Three months behind in our house payment, shot our credit. We were on food stamps, okay? I mean, top of the world in February and totally humbled in, in, in August. And I realized, man, I tell everybody they have to find a coach or a mentor and follow in their footsteps. And I'm not even taking my own advice. And so I thought uh, I got to find a speaker, a successful speaker. And uh, I went to this, I found out about National Speakers Association. And they had actually had a chapter in Houston where I lived at the time. And there's about 50 speakers there, but there were only two that were really making it happen. Everybody else were, the, uh, you know, eternal learners. <laughs> no action, just learning like a PhD that doesn't do anything. <laughs> and uh, there's PhDs that do stuff, but some of them don't. <laughs> and so uh, I, I went up to one of them. His name, his name was Jim. I said, hey, will you be my mentor? Will you teach me the ropes? And at first he didn't want to because he was tired of dealing with these eternal learner people. And I told him, man, I'll do whatever you say. If you tell me I have to shave my head and wear a lipstick to, to be a speaker, we'll do it right now. And, so, <laughs> and I'll make you proud, okay? Uh, a few years, you'll be able to point to me and say, hey, I helped that guy out. Okay, fine. We'll meet once a month. You got me for an hour. Bring a notepad with questions. Ask me whatever you want. At the end, we'll give you some some homework, okay? And if we ever meet and you haven't done last month's homework, it's over, all right? And so I said, great. And you take me to lunch. I said, sounds great. Except I can't afford to buy you lunch. I'm on food stamps, okay? It's going to be Starbucks. You can have anything on the menu as long as it's coffee of the day. Put as much sugar in it as you want. <laughs> and so the first time we met, he said, I don't care if you're a 10-time Olympian. Unless you write a book, no one's going to take you seriously. And I told him, I can't write a book. I made C's in English. And he said, hey, you got a great story. You write it down. We'll give it to some A students. They clean up the grammar. That's just editing, okay? And I said, wow, I didn't think about that. He goes, yeah, it's editing. So shut up and sit down. I mean, this guy was tough. It was like dealing with Sopranos. But one thing that he told me, well, it, and that, that little thing that I just told you made me realize that, wow, this guy's been through the road right? He's been through that minefield and he's got experience. And these things that seem like end of the world to me is just a piece of cake to him because he's done it, right? So I just need to listen to this guy. And one thing that he told me was, Ruben, done is better than perfect, okay? Perfectionists don't ever get anything done. He says, we're just going to contact everybody. You're going to speak everywhere just to get your name out there, your face out there. You never know who's going to see you. And, but you're going to just throw mud on the wall, okay? And eventually something's going to happen. We can, we can clean up the mess later. And six, 16 years later, 
I'm still throwing mud on the wall. <laughs> but most people try to be everything be perfect and clean and, you know, and uh, tidy. No, man, success is, uh, is done like that. You have to get out there and, you know, take some licks. And you say you, you, you're still throwing mud against the wall, but I've seen the testimonials on your website, and they're ridiculous. Stephen Covey, Jim Rohn, Lou Holtz just completely inspired by your speeches, which I, I will link to one of those in the show notes section on the website. Oh, cool. You mentioned accountability earlier in the conversation. Can you define or can you tell me about social pressure and how people can use that to hold themselves accountable? Okay, yeah, sure. You know, I didn't know I was doing this in high school, but when this kid uh, – told me uh, my name needed to be Bulldog because I was tenacious. I It was just as I was walking out of the library. I turned around, went back inside, got a book about Bulldogs because I wanted to make sure. <laughs> and, uh, and they checked out. They're known for the tenaciousness. And I was so impressed by what I read that the next person I met, I said, hey, my name's Ruben, but you can call me Bulldog, right? And from then on, I was Bulldog. But by doing that, and I didn't know I was doing it, but I was creating this this peer pressure, this positive pressure, that I, now I had to live up to it. I couldn't be a quitter and a whiner, not if I'm bulldog, right? And so by telling people about your goals and dreams and by, uh, you know, uh, you got to, they'll be watching you, right? And now you got this pressure because you have to deliver. And um, and your coaches and your mentors, same thing, you know, you want to be able to uh, keep them as coaches and mentors. So you better, you better do what they advise. So that's, that's how I use it myself. Very nice. Very nice. And I put it out there, you know, uh, it's funny. Uh, this is crazy, okay? And I'm not going to say this guy's name. But when I, uh, when I decided back in, uh, uh, well, 2008, that I was going to start training to see if I could make the Vancouver Olympics, there were two groups of people. There was a group of people that said, oh, Ruben, yeah, and you're going to win the gold medal because you're so positive. And I had to correct them. I told them, no, man, you know, positive mental attitude, well, you'll always do better. But it doesn't guarantee success, okay? It doesn't because there's always somebody that's probably going to be better technically. So, uh, but thanks. Now, on the other end, there were these guys that said, and particularly this one speaker, he said, "Oh, you shouldn't do that because if you if you if you don't make it, it's going to be bad for your brand." I said, "Are you crazy, man? I don't care. I, this is my dream, okay? It's not about the brand. And if I mess up, it's okay. It's part of the story." Uh, but he didn't get it. He was a risk averse, I guess. He was just talking about it in his motivational speeches, but they weren't from uh, personal, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, from something that he actually done. <laughs> so that that brings to mind my conversation with Adam Creek, who did win a gold medal in, at the 2008 Beijing Olympics in men's rowing. And he, he considers himself uh, slow and lazy you know, of course, because he's he's an Olympic he's an Olympic gold champion. So of course he's slow. He's slow and lazy. But that's how that's how he, he that, oh, that, that's how he thinks of himself. But um, I wow. asked him, you know, when you travel to speak, how do you hold yourself accountable to working out? What he does is when somebody books him for a gig, he tells them, "All right, so you got a speaker, and congratulations. You you also get a personal trainer for free. Uh, every day before I speak at, at seven a.m." I'm going to show up at the gym and I'm going to lead a workout session. And he, he, he came up with that little clever way because then he's got to show up. He can't not show up to work out at that point, right? Um, he's told people. So that's how he holds himself accountable, which I thought was very – That's really very, good. Very What's his name? His name's Adam Creek. Adam Creek. That's awesome. I like that. Yeah, he's, he's an awesome guy. There's a quote by Marianne Williamson that kept popping up in my head – while I was reading your book, and the quote is that our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are that we are powerful beyond measure. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that quote. Maybe that was the the, the fear that that guy had when he was trying to say, "Oh, you, this might be bad for your for your brand." But uh, I. I always felt, especially as, as I was a kid, and I always had this low self-image because of um, getting bullied so much in, in school. And and I think that maybe, it's funny, I, I was, Jack Canfield was uh, interviewing me for his, for his uh, he, he put me in his Success Principles book. Uh, I'm actually in three different chapters in there. Uh, and I called his office to, uh, to, 
just to see if he would write a testimonial for for one of my books. And he got on the phone, which is rare. You never get the guy on the phone. It's usually the secretary. Uh, but he said, you got five minutes. And we spoke for an hour and a half, okay? <laughs> he says, hey, I'm writing this book. I'd love for you to be in it and blah, blah, blah. But, but he is really into... Uh, Self-image, right? He believes your self-image, if you, have, if you have a huge self-image, you can do more. And he says, you must have a great self-image to do all the things you did, Ruben. And I told him, no, man, I think I had a lousy self-image. Maybe it was kind of like a Napoleonic complex in my case that I had to prove to myself that I was okay. And he didn't like that answer. <laughs> so he didn't put me in the self-image chapter. But, <laughs> but I think that's really it. And it's funny, it wasn't until I was a three-time Olympian that I started feeling okay in my own skin. I mean, isn't that bad? But now I feel fine. I don't know what got me talking about that, but but I think that uh, you, you feel inadequate, right? Uh, I felt inadequate all my life. And um, the powerful beyond measure, I don't think that part hit me so much because I always felt inadequate. The first two years in the luge circuit, actually when I was learning luge in in Lake Placid was physically was a huge challenge. I mean, I was breaking bones. I was getting hurt, but I just, you know, my mindset was a broken bone is a temporary inconvenience. I'm going to keep coming back. But the second two years, uh, all of a sudden I'm in, imagine, you know, you've been driving, you just learn how to drive. You just got your driver's permit. You got your license, right? But you're not any good. You're not ready to go race in Indianapolis 500, but now you're in this room with all these champions, right? You got Mario Andretti and AJ Foyt and all these guys are sitting there and and you're thinking, what the hell am I doing here? I don't belong here. And I couldn't even look at them in the eyes because I these guys are champions, right? Olymp- there's like five Olympic champions in this room and I barely know how to get down the track. And I just forced myself to keep coming back, right? I should have to go for those points, try to get those World Cup points. I just kept forcing myself to come back. And then just a couple of weeks before the Olympics, I finally had enough points to be in the, back then it was the top 50 got to go. And the Germans who ruled the sport back then, they still do, they wouldn't even give me the time of day. I'd say hello to them, they wouldn't even say hello back. It's like I was invisible. And that just made me feel even worse, right? And it wasn't until one year after my second, uh, one year after the, uh, the, the Calgary Olympics, one year after my first Olympics, or two years after, it's like a memo went out to, hey, we can be nice to Ruben now. And it's like all of a sudden, everybody the same day, hey, Ruben, oh, Gonzalez, Speedy Gonzalez, oh, how are you? And I got mad. I said, man, I've been nice to you guys for six years, and all of a sudden, I'm Speedy Gonzalez, what's up with that? And and they said, look, let us explain something to you. And we sat down. They all sat around me. And they said, look, we've been doing this since we were five years old. We're the best in our town, and the best in our region, best in our country. And there's so much competition here. We have so much depth that we'll be lucky if we do two Olympics, okay? And and then we'll, you know what we're going to do? We're doing this for life, okay? So we're going to be coaches for the rest of our life. Because that's what we do. And we're sick and tired of these small countries coming and, and competing. And they do one Olympics and then they disappear. You know what we call them? We call them Olympic tourists, okay? Because <laughs> they have, you know, they're not committed. You, and now you're here. Obviously, it's the second year after your first Olympics. You're going after your second one. Whether you make it or not, it doesn't matter, okay? But you're showing respect to the sport by being back here. And so now we can show respect to you. Because you're committed to. So you gained credibility to them. I did. And it blew me away. I, I, I actually didn't understand that for years. Okay. And now uh, I try to get the newbies to, you know, the, the one-time Olympians. I try, I'm try. i not mean about it. I tell them, look, I'll tell them that story. I tell them, look, your second one will be so much better. There'll be no butterflies. You'll do so much better. You'll have fun. And uh, just, just do two. Just do two. You can quit after that. <laughs> and a few of them take me up on it. <laughs> Very nice. Theoretically, when I thought about that question, adding that question in the show, I realized after that, I, after I asked it, that that was probably a really, really dumb question. I'm a, I'm a, <laughs> I'm asking the guy that that wants to to make the Olympics as he's 59 years old if his deepest fear is that he's powerful beyond measure. No, I think you you broke the mold, uh, my man. I, well, you know what? I've had I had somebody else uh, mention that quote, and I really never understood it. <laughs> uh, but maybe 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 most people they 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 fear that that's a fear that they're powerful beyond measure, and maybe the responsibility that would come with reaching your your uh, you know 
your top levels would just be too much responsibility and it wouldn't be worth it. Maybe maybe that's maybe that's it. I don't know. I think people can't handle being great or being special. P- people are very comfortable. They want to be in their comfort zone. And whenever you transcend your comfort zone and you do something that you're not used to, you're in a different element, right? And so that there's there's always fear with leaving what you're comfortable with. And, and Do the Work by Stephen Pressfield, a book, he, he talks about resistance being our number one enemy. And he, he, wrote, a, he wrote a screenplay, and uh, I died laughing when I read it, but he said, he did King Kong Lives, and he was pumped. Him and his friend, they wrote this screenplay. They had finally made it in Hollywood. Then the reviews came, and I can't remember his friend's name, but the review said, Stephen Pressfield, I hope for the sake of his parents that that isn't his real name. It, oh, this wow. is the worst movie we've ever, ever seen. <laughs> and, and, you know, he, he talks about that resistance of all the outside forces, even your family, your friends. They like you the way you are. So even they resist whenever you want to do something special. So having the, the self-belief in yourself and, and being strong and, you know, accepting the change that comes with it. Because at the end of the day, when you do better yourself, it's better for everybody. A, a rising tide raises all boats, right? Yep. Amen. Can you describe for me a, an ideal day in your life? I get up at six in the morning, get a cup of coffee, and then I'll go work out for well, for about an hour just here in the house. Uh, and these days, it's a lot of stretching uh, as, as part of the workout because uh, that's what that's what coach says I need. Oh. And then I make breakfast for the kids and we homeschool our kids. So we're all in the house all the time. And then, uh, and then I'll come back to my office and, and work and, and make contacts and talk to people. And then, uh, when I'm done, we live in Colorado Springs, you know, maybe go for a hike. Uh, there's so much natural beauty out here or even walking out in our backyard. We're, we're, we're on seven acres and it's really nice rolling terrain. It's beautiful. So um, just hanging out and, and, and enjoying the beauty. And sometimes there's a deer out there or a Canada goose or uh, there's a lot of hummingbirds out now or some once in a while coyote. There were about 100 elk came through our backyard last, last season. It was amazing. And so that's, that's an ideal day, you know. You just feel, golly, thanks, thank you, God, you know. <laughs> this is awesome. How do you maintain working out? I am, I assume you travel for speaking engagements and stuff like that and even training fairly regularly. How do you work out on the road? I have a list of exercises and it's they actually believe it or not, they don't have me doing a lot of weight lifting uh for for what I need now. They said, "Look, you're really strong. Your lower back for the uh, for the start, uh the, the first motion where you're where you where you're uh, it's basically like doing a, a, a deadlift, right? You're all bent, and then you're pushing forward. That part, you're strong, okay? But when you're paddling, you are paddle like a girl, okay? <laughs> no, <laughs> so no, no offense need... to the girls out there, by the way. No, no offense. But uh, but you have to uh, – we have to work on your hip flexibility. And so they have me doing all this yoga stuff that, you know, I'd rather be doing weightlifting, honestly. But all, this, all these uh, exercises to – to stretch its a uh, mobility hip hip mobility sequences uh, to open up the hips so that I'm able to when I'm paddling go further out and have more strength and be able the the goal is and I drive fine I said you drive fine okay with a new sled you'll be great um, but we got to do something about that paddling because if we can gain one mile an hour or even two miles an hour before curve one right your velocity before curve one that'll translate through the whole track. And so that's that's where you have the most to gain, and so um, so that's the plan. So that's easy to do. I mean, I can do that in a hotel room, and I, and I do some calisthenic stuff too, and you know, uh, uh, using my own weight as well, kind of like Herschel Walker. You know, a lot of push-ups and sit-ups, stuff like that, because they don't want me actually getting tighter. They want me to get looser. Do you take any supplements or anything like that? I watch the salt. I try not to use hardly any salt. I have a lot of protein with my food. Uh, and I like, I'm, a, I'm an Argentine beef eater. So, uh, so that's, um, and I do take some, uh, some lots of supplements. In fact, my best friend is a doctor and he, and I have blood tests done every three months, very comprehensive blood tests. And depending on what, you know, all the different criteria, he, 
keep, I've got a handful of vitamins that I take every day to keep the levels. And this is in, in his uh, parameters, right? His standards are a lot higher than, uh, you know, a general practitioner, right? This is like for peak performance stuff. And so we started doing this a couple of years ago with my friend, uh, Carlos, and I started losing all his weight. And that's what I put the idea in my head that, hey, I, it took me so long to learn how to drive this darn sled. Uh, why not do another one? What sort of testing does Carlos do with you? And for somebody out there that also wants to, to increase their, their a healthy regimen, what actionable could they take? Oh, boy. Well, <laughs> I'm just reading it from – I have a whole file here with all my tests, right? It's blood tests, right? So, But here's here's some PSA, T3 and T4, which is a testosterone – uh, TSH, which I have no clue what that is, estradiol, lipid profiles, hemoglobin profiles, uh, complete metabolic panels, which whatever that's, you know, some lab lab uh, person would know what that means, CBC, and then DHT levels. I mean, that's, even though it's chemistry and biology, I, that, that's, that, that's gibberish to me. But, but I know that they take about four vials of blood. It's a few hundred bucks, but it's worth it. And, uh, and then based on that, he's able to prescribe what I need. And I take my blood pressure every day to make sure that the things that I'm taking are, you know, you have to tweak these things, right? And so, so he's just keeping an eye on me. And so I'm a soldier, you know, I'm a good soldier. And that's what I tell people to do. Uh, when I was a kid, my dad always said, if you have to run through a minefield, it's probably a good idea to follow somebody who's already crossed it and still walking, right? <laughs> and so I've always looked for the coach, the mentor, the person and I just I just humble myself to their leadership because they know what they're talking about. And then I, and, and it has to be somebody that has fruit on the trees, not a theorist. Somebody actually did it, right? And and so uh, I just listen to the coaches and I do it. I mean, when I climbed Kilimanjaro, I just followed the guide, right? I just stepped where he stepped for five days. I got a picture on top of Africa uh, before I ran with the bulls, you know, all that stuff that I sent you. Uh, I read three books about Pamplona. I called the guy on the phone. I got some coaching because I, I wanted the experience, but I didn't want to die. And so um, that's that's all I do. I just I'm a good follower. Dying would not be fun. No, that messes it all yeah, up. Yeah, that that kind of ruin <laughs> ruins the experience. Yeah, you can't tell your grandkids about. Yeah, it. I hope you show up at my funeral if I die. By the way, <laughs> 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 because this is public record. Um, at, oh, at it must point. have been a typo. Uh, you weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, how did you feel as far as energy levels and focus goes uh, before versus after Carlos started doing your blood work and you started taking the supplements? Much better. Uh, very sharp. Uh, I can work longer. I have, uh, uh, you know, 25 pounds is a big difference. Oh, my God. So I, uh, I'm i actually, I'm, I'm much fitter. I'm probably fitter than I've ever been. I played college soccer, and I'm almost, I'm almost uh, to where I have a faint outline of a six-pack on a 55-year-old man that's always had a keg, not a six-pack. And if I keep it up, who knows? Maybe I'll get that six-pack. That'll be cool. But... I feel energetic. I have more, yeah, more zip. That's great to hear. Yeah, and I eat better. I mean, I have this, uh, if you go to rubentips.com, R-U-B-E-N, tips, T-I-P-S, dot com, that's where you can sign up for my newsletter, and actually I have a bunch of articles there. You can test drive me before you you send, you know, you fill in that thing. But there's one down there that says how, how I lost 25 pounds, and so that tells the whole story. So I watch what I eat, right? I mean, uh, it's like the Tim Ferriss stuff. That he teaches, I kind of combined it. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm really good six days a week, and then I get a cheat day. And it's funny, I was on a plateau after about two years of being good, and and I read about that cheat day, and I lost a few pounds uh, after doing the cheat day, and it made it all easier. Uh, so very low, you know, hardly any, any carbs, right? Zero sugar. I don't even eat fruit, right? Because fruit's just, it, it's, it's sugar, guys. Fruit is sugar. I don't even eat a grape. For six days and then on the on on saturdays you know i can go eat some pasta or or i eat a lot of fruit because i actually like i miss the fruit yeah i'm with you i love the fruit i love the carbs too i love the bread it's all <laughs> yeah bread oh good french bread is just unbelievable what software or tools do you use every day in your life 
to stay productive? I use LinkedIn a lot. Uh, I know that's not a software, but I use that a lot to connect with people. And uh, I actually, you know, I'm do a plug for somebody. If you really want to learn how to do LinkedIn, and and I'm just now learning how to use Twitter uh, because there were things about Twitter that I didn't know. And, uh, well, my gosh, it's totally different now. Uh, so there's a guy that actually lives here, uh, here in the Springs as well. His name is Kevin Knebel, K N E B L. And he has these courses, these online courses, uh, where he teaches this stuff. And it's like 17 hours worth of, of, of courses. Uh, and it's, I think it's, it, it might be a thousand bucks, but I've already made it up. And so that, that's helped me a lot. Um, and, and as far as, cause I'm, I'm in the, you know, you got to connect with people and, and when you sell, I wasn't ever the pushy salesman cause the pushy salesman, you know, they might make one sale, but then they don't make a client. And so I was always trying to uh, create a relationship and then nurture that relationship because, you know, people, when, when, when they do need your product, they're going to buy from somebody that they like and they trust. Right. And so you got to work on the like and trust with people that could possibly buy your product, but you can't be pushy. And so uh, he teaches a lot about that, relationship marketing. Um, what else do I use? Very simple, my, my business. I mean, I, I uh, use emails, and when I write stuff, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll just write it on. It used to be on, on – I use pages, right, and, and, and write articles and submit them, turn them into PDFs. And then uh, when I write books, I use – I have a whole thing in my website where I – teach people actually don't teach them but it's where they can get information on, on if you want to write a book you know where do you go get your cover how do you lay it out you know and, and etc um and then you know if you if you keep throwing mud on the wall cool things start to happen i mean just last week i had a romanian a romanian uh publisher uh said hey we'd like to you know we'd like to translate your latest latest book to romanian they've done some of the other ones in the past and so they pay me a little bit out of that and a little bit of royalties, but mainly I get out there, right? Now I might get a gig in, in Romania. And then last night I got one from China. It was, yeah, China, and then a couple of weeks before that was India. It's like, I don't know, these people must talk to each other because all of a sudden all these publishers from around the world. But um, a few years ago, uh, I get this call from Poland, and, and, and this guy said, um, hey, we're having, you know, we... We read your book in Polish. I didn't know I had a Polish book at the time, or I must have forgotten. But we love your story. Uh, we're having a leadership conference in Warsaw. Would you like to come and speak for us? And, uh, and, and golly, we took the whole family to, we spent a week in, in Poland, then a week in Spain, and came back home, the four of us. We still had money left over from that gig. So thank God I listened to my mentor to write that book, right? Because <laughs> it, it has opened up doors everywhere. And talk about a life of, of adventure. You know, those are those are adventures that oh you yeah remember forever. Yeah, absolutely. Poland was great. Oh my gosh, I thought okay, Eastern Bloc is going to be all you know worn down and you know poor and everything. No, they've totally rebuilt it. They like Americans over there because everybody's got an uncle in Chicago, <laughs> and and the food's really good and the dollar is strong because they're not part of the European. Um, you know, the community. And so you go out there and you go to all the best restaurants. It doesn't even hurt. Money goes a long way. Now, Poland is a great place. It uh, looks like I might be going back soon. They're, they're, they started emailing me a couple of weeks ago. That's a good sign. That, that is a great sign. If you could help everyone learn one truth about the world, what would that truth be? You can do so much more. You can do so much. You can accomplish so much more than you think you can. And so find somebody that's uh, done what you want to do and just and, and, and listen to them and let them help you because that will speed up your learning curve and they will support you. And don't be afraid because successful people, they like to talk about success. You're not imposing on them because you know what happens when you become successful? Uh, you always hear about successful people being, uh, you know, it's like they're missing something inside that wasn't enough. Yeah, it's because uh, the step after success is called significance. That means you're creating, you're making a difference. You're you're creating a ripple effect of success in other people. So successful people are always looking for a mentor that wants to take action, right? And so if you do what they say, you're going to be helping them become significant. So it helps both of you guys. So that's what I would tell them. That's very good, and you're you're absolutely right. It's hard to see somebody who who's like a, a younger reflection of you. 
and turn them away. As a mentor, I found it, at least in poker, you know, I've seen guys, guys have come to me that I see myself in and I, I'm, I'm not going to turn them away. I'm going to give them all the things I wish I knew when I was their age. I'm going to just do everything that I can to make, to give them the highest possible chance of reaching their potential. Yeah. Yeah. I had, a, I had the, um, well, the two guys in the Argentinian team, uh, luge team. Uh, I was the first one in South America, right? And so then the next Olympics, there was uh, these guys from Venezuela popped up. And then then, then later, uh, a team from uh, Brazil showed up, right? And so it started to spread. And and I've had people call me over the years, and you know how it is. Very few actually do anything. But there was this one guy in California. He's, he's from Argentina, and he called me about it. And he's kind of like a ninja warrior type guy. He does all that kind of stuff. So he's very fit. And he's been losing for four years. He just missed out making the Olympics in uh, in Pyeongchang uh, a few months ago. But he's still in it. And, you know, I'm going to be competing against him uh, um, in in Beijing. He's going to have to miss the next one, too, because I'm I'm taking Beijing, baby. But, uh, but there's also this girl that lives in Whistler, Canada, right where the luge track is. And she's from Argentina. And they contacted me a few years ago. And they said, hey, you know, uh, who do we talk to? What do we do? And, man, of course I'm not going to hold back. Gosh, how cool would that be? And she, she made the Pyeongchang team. And she's actually good because she lives there, right? And so she trains so much. She, she's like 19 years old. She's got more runs than, than I ever had in my whole career. But, uh, but it feels great. I mean, if she actually won a medal, you know, became the first South American to, uh, to win a, uh, an Olympic, uh, winter Olympic medal, how, how do you think, you think I'm going to feel bad? I don't feel so proud. Oh my gosh. I'll be bouncing off the walls. So happy for her. For sure. You'll be on cloud nine. And even if I, even if I didn't make the Olympics and she made it, it's like, man, I, I still feel awesome. Of course. Of course. You, we, when we invest in people and, and they succeed, we share in that success. Yep. What's something that you're working on that matters a great deal to you or in the words of Dan Gottlieb, allows your soul to breathe. You know, when I, when I got back into the luge, uh, that gave me this sense of purpose that I hadn't had in years. I'm real ADD and, um, and I get bored easy. Right. And so I, I, I thrive when, when there's a challenge and I love having a challenge and everything kind of aligned, uh, business wise and the story became better. And, um, just chasing that dream. So that's that's one thing. Another thing is um, our daughter is just about ready to go to college and and preparing her and helping her because we homeschool. Well, my wife does it, but uh, uh, just making sure that, that we're doing everything right to give her the best chances. And she got accepted at all four that she tried um, and, and almost getting a full ride. So it's great. Now our son, uh, he's 13, and uh, it looks like he might end up going to the Air Force Academy. And it's very, very competitive to do that. Only about 10% of the applicants make it. But he's got what it takes. And so we're working with helping him uh, check all the boxes, even though it's, you know, we're ways away. But we want to be ahead of the game, ahead of the uh, eight ball, so that he can make his dream come true. And I've told them, you know, I've told them a million times, because uh, people will ask me on those Q&As, they'll ask me, do you want your kids to be Olympians? And I tell them, look, they have to figure out what their dream is, okay? Um, if, if for them, uh, if he wants to be an aeronautical engineer or a, or, or a pilot, if that's his Olympics, then he needs to go for that, okay? If Gabby wants to be a counselor, a, a Christian counselor, and that's going to be the Olympics for her and making it and building that business is her gold medal, then that's her Olympics, okay? Uh, I just happen to do the Olympics. That's mine. And so my job is to continue uh, chasing my dreams so I can be a good example to them and then they can see the process. And we're circling back around to living a life that's true to yourself. And your parents wanted you to be a doctor. Not that there's obviously nothing wrong with being a doctor. And for some people, being a doctor and a healer is that's living a life that's true to themselves. But for you, it was an Olympian. So chasing your own yeah. dreams and, and your own things that move you. 
Yeah, and just inspiring other people, you know. Uh, and that's I, sometimes I say this from stage. I say, look, you guys can tell I'm having a good time here, right? I mean, I, I enjoy doing this, but you know what? I don't live to speak. Okay, I'm having a blast. I love sharing this information and helping and inspiring people. Hopefully, you know. But uh, but I don't live to do this. Okay, uh, this is a vehicle to create the lifestyle that allows us to do the things that we want to do in our family. See, and so you need to look at your job or your business as a vehicle that'll help you reach whatever your personal goals are. And if you do that, then at the end, you'll be happy and you'll know that you lived a good life because you were true to yourself, like you said. Awesome. There's some guys that just can't, oh my gosh, I know some guys, you, you, some speakers. I don't have very many speaker friends because uh, there's a lot of ego-driven guys in this business. And I kind of fell in through the back door, so that wasn't a problem with me. But some of these guys, I can't even take, you know, go meet them for coffee because they're enunciating when they're, you know, when they're asked, well, I'll have the chicken and I'd like to have the, uh, the, the special sauce with it. And I'm thinking, shut up, man. You're making us look stupid here. <laughs> you know, let's just talk like a human being. Right. Stay humble. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like I'm talking to you, that's exactly how I speak uh, to the groups. You know, it's a conversation. You know, I'm just sharing from the heart. And, and it's funny. The first couple of years, I had a list of the stories I was going to tell. Right, and it's kind of like the uh, a rock band has a list of the songs that they're gonna play in, in a concert, and and it was great. But then one day, after about two years, I actually gave myself permission. I said, "Ruben, you have permission that if you want to change gears, shift gears in the middle of the if your talk, just because you have this this feeling, right, then go with it." Okay. And when I started doing that, the crowds went wild. And I started hearing, man, you're so real. You're so genuine. Yeah, I'm just telling you what I feel from my heart. You know, take it or leave it. Yeah, it's easy to come off as real when you're being real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's easy. It's, and it's easy, too. I mean, it's a lot less work. Right, right. All right, Ruben, um, I got one last question for you. I've loved this interview. It's amazing, amazing experience. Where can people find you on the World Wide Web? Okay, I'll uh, give you a couple of them. Uh, one of them is rubentips.com. That's where you get a bunch of free stuff. And then my main page of the website is thelugeman.com. So it's T H E L U G E M A N.com. And uh, the Iceman was taken. That would have been so much easier. <laughs> but some, some slushy company owns the Iceman, and I can't afford to buy it from them. But uh, boy, that would have been easy. But I'm the Luge Man. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. But thank you for being on the show, man. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks, Brad. Uh, that was awesome. Your questions were terrific. Make it an Olympic day. <laughs> <laughs>